and he got a job as a draftsman that spent his evenings in coffee houses singing and playing the guitar. And this side of his life eventually took over, and he went on to become an enormously popular singer with 11 gold albums to date. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please give a warm welcome to John Denver. <laughs> I think, John, welcome to you. I think these are some of your own words. They're rather strange. I'm not outrageous, I'm not sexy, and I'm not a great singer. I said that? I think so. <laughs> Did you? I certainly said that I'm not outrageous and don't try to be. Uh, if I said I'm not sexy, it's just that's not the parameters within which I think of myself. Right. Uh, a great singer, I'm nothing compared to someone like Placido Domingo. I have a good voice, and I use it well, and I think that I'm getting better. No, I don't think I'm a great singer. So that all those things are true, but you've got out of them very neatly. I was going to ask who booked you. <laughs> if you were none of these things, who booked you? But yes. You've actually, <laughs> you've actually wiggled away out of that. Your first guitar was from your granny. Yes, my grandmother gave me a guitar that was made in 1910, and I got it when I was about 12 years old. And your parents had aspirations for you other than that of a performer? Well, I think my parents, you know, they didn't really think that doing something in show business was a real living. You know what I mean? I know. And so uh, I what think... What do you do for a proper job? Ex yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So what did they want you to be? Uh, anything that I wanted to be. It's just that that was also under there. Mm. And I think that they were a little bit surprised and shocked when I decided to leave college to go see what I could do with my music. Uh, but also it was the, really, truly the greatest expression of love that I've experienced in my life is when my parents, who really observed me doing something they thought was against everything, that they could really believe in and support uh, really gave me what they could to support me in doing that and said, when you get tired of messing around and need to go back to school again, let us know, we'll be there for did you. Did they do the same thing? Well, I think they'd have liked me to have gone to university and uh, become a doctor or something mm. really um, mm. outstanding, yes. Yes. not just a dancer. One of the most fascinating things uh, is that in the last years, you've actually broken down a part of your nature or your character or the inside of you by something called, what is Est? Uh, EST is Earhart Seminars Training. It's one of the many self-discovery uh, actions or seminars or Why did you want to discover like more that. about yourself? Was it something you were uncomfortable with? Oh, I think that, uh, you know, as part of what Tom Wolfe called in the 1970s the me decade, we really want to know who we are. There are things going on. We learn more and more about us, ourselves all the time. And to really find out what it, make, what it is that makes us tick and how we are and can be really individuals and how our lives can make a difference. You know, these are things that I think we What do you have to, to do for this sort of thing? Uh, the S training or mm -hmm. discovering yourself? Well, no, for I this the kind of training. What, how severe is the it? The training is, uh, is two weekends, mm -hmm. and uh, it was quite an incredible experience in my life. Uh, I'll forever be grateful for the experience. I got a great deal out of it. What is Rolfing? Rolfing uh, is a thing developed by a lady whose name is Ida Rolf. And what it has to do is a very deep massage technique to realign the muscles on the structural system. So often people, through the process of growing, through the act of uh, gravity working on them, through the kind of jobs like uh, uh, for a guitar dancing, oh, guitar for playing. a guitar player, you know, I, get, I have to hold that guitar up all yeah. the time. And so you sort of get out of balance. And what Rolfing is about, what uh, Ida called it, was structural integration and getting yourself back in alignment with gravity so that you can work a little bit more efficiently, stand a little taller, uh, and do to do, talk, do talk show hosts uh, get into that <laughs> as well? You would know better than I, sir, and it's possible, yes. But, but you've hosted talk shows, or you've ho hosted shows, haven't yes, you? Yes, BBC shows. Yes. Where you were not fully clothed one night. How do you know about that? Because <laughs> little birdie came and flew over the top of the building. What happened? Quite a few years ago, my first experience in television was working at BBC Two. I did a television show from Shepherd's Bush Green. And uh, the show was live on television, as this is. It was an hour show. Sometimes it was 54 minutes. Sometimes it was 58 minutes, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were two film segments pre-recorded in each of the shows that we did to give us a chance to go change costumes or set up the stage for something new. And uh, on the second show that we did, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> on the second show that we did, uh, I went over to change uh, trousers and shirts for the final part of the show, and in the process, uh, the zipper on my trousers became undone and was not able to get done up again. And there was not time to find another pair of trousers or to get back in the ones that I'd just taken off, and so I had to go out and stand in front of an audience that was right here and a television camera right here 
uh, with my trousers undone. And it was the most <laughs> uncomfortable situation to be in. Did the guitar find itself in an uncomfortable situation? Well, unfortunately, I didn't have time either to lengthen the guitar strap to get it <laughs> down to a little bit of, of some value, but uh, so it didn't Or help. do a bit of rolfing. Yes. <laughs> Whatever that Except the be. opposite of that, so I could have stood a little bit shorter, perhaps. All right, right. One of the things also <laughs> which I, I... Yes, I realize that. One of the things you say with some astonishment is that, that uh, the success gives you freedom. That, to, that it gives you freedom to actually do what you want to do. Would you be doing other, other than what you're doing if you... No, I don't think so, but, but success, if, if you have uh, some security in what you've done out of the success of doing it, uh, then perhaps you're a little bit more willing and able to stretch out, you know, to try something uh, a little bit further away mm. from you right. in regard to, well, in, in my case, uh, to try new forms of music. I, the, the best example that I use in that is, is the Beatles, you know, they... They really start off as just a rock and roll band, and then out of their great success, we're really able to give a large part of their their innermost feelings to to put that into their music also, and to have it received. Very but that's well. only you can only do that when you've achieved a plateau, like both of you do. You can actually choose what work you then mm. want to do, which is the most uh, enviable position to be in. Yeah. I think so. However, there are prices to be paid. Yes. I mean, presumably you paid a price with your marriage, have you? Well, I think that my success and my commitment to the work that I do certainly had an effect on Annie's and my relationship. Annie uh, is the Annie of Annie's song? Yes, yes. When did you write that for her? I wrote that about <coughs> seven years ago, eight years ago. And was the marriage good then at that time? It was wonderful. The song says what it was. The song says what it was. But w when did it go wrong? Well, I think over the last four, five, six years, uh, we started drifting away from one another. And uh, uh, part of it had to do with the amount of time that we spent not together and the things that we, I suppose, got locked into and not being together and then an inflexibility when we got back together to sort of integrate the other's life into our own. Uh, within that, we sort of found that we had different interests, we had different friends, uh, we had very little in common. Do you see her? Yes, I do. You've written a song now called Falling Out of Love, haven't you? Yes. Is, who is it about? Well, it's certainly about this, this fact of my experience over the last few years. So it's, it's Annie's song again, isn't it, in a kind of way? I suppose so. In fact, you know, one of the things that I, uh, that I try to think of when I write songs is that what is it like for that person out there, not just my experience, but if it were someone else, is this what they would feel like? And truly, in writing this song, uh, I wondered what it must have been like for Annie as well as I. And, and I think that it's uh, that I found it. Will you sing it for us now? I'd love to. Falling out of love, John Dent. Your heart no longer flutters 
You no longer look through a lover's eyes But what's to see when the world falls down around you? You simply can't believe it But it comes as no surprise This is what it's like Falling out of love And this is the way you lose Your very best friend This is how it feels When it's all over This is just the way True love ends What's the sense of failure? It's such an incredible loss It's all the things you'll never do And all the dreams that will never come true This is what it's like Falling out of love This is the way you lose your very best friend This is how it feels when it's all over This is just the way a true love ends Oh, this is just the way a true love ends And I don't believe a true love ever ends oh. John Denver, from John Turvey, from Wayne C, from Susan Coppermey. Thank you. Good night. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Russell Harty's guests tomorrow at 6.50 include Diana Dawes in her first appearance since her recent illness and David Essex who will be talking about his new musical.